Welcome to COVID and Climate Change Correlations, a weekly video podcast where I, Daniel Sanderson, engage in a stimulating conversation with post-Keynesian economist Steve Keen. All right. The, 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 the wakelets, they're very, very good. I really like them. The which, sorry? The, your, your concept. You call them wake, wakelets, the... Um... The links to you know the suggestion you made about for the new liberals. Oh, I'm having a bit of a brain gap here. So I gather, yeah, no, yeah. using your wakelet, your wakelet strategy, you know, the uh, in, indexed articles to back up a another article. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah that's um, even a little bit about what uh, Scott had been working on years ago. He'd worked on. Uh, some of the first, um, what do you call it? Like uh, hyperlinks. And oh, okay. yeah. I remember reading uh, good old George Steiner and this, uh, he's one of my favorite Meridians as an author. I don't know if you heard of him, but mm. he's uh, uh, he passed away a couple of years ago and yeah. he was um, uh, a, a critic, like a literary critic. So he, yeah. he, he, um, you know, he wrote a book on Martin Heidegger and he, you know, he's, uh, you know, very well read and a little bit of a hoity toity, but I just love, uh, I love his writing and his, yeah. his love for, uh, academics, uh, basically classical, uh, literature. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, anyways, um, I think we all kind of return to some books from time to time, uh, do you have any of those kinds of books or favorite um, authors that you kind of uh, go back to over a I period of had, time? I wish I had time. Um, I'm just overwhelmed by the workload I've got these days. So I read what's appropriate for what I'm working on, uh, which almost always means journal articles these days. Uh, like if I, my, my favorite author from economics in many ways is John Blatt, who uh, wrote, he was a mathematician who got exposed to Neoclassical economics. Have I told this tale to you before? I'm not sure. No, no. But I mean, I with my memory, well, we got two two options here, Steve. Right? Because yeah. remember, we say we can keep repeating the stuff, right? Because oh, yeah, people yeah. tune in, you know, to whatever yeah, yeah. episode. Right? Okay. Okay. Well, um, I mean, in my approach is, you know, is quite mathematical to economics. Uh, a, a lot of critics say mathematics is the problem. I said mathematics was abused by neoclassical economists. It was never done properly by them, and and that's been a cover. And in fact, the way to pull them apart is to use decent mathematics. Uh, anyway, um, that was that came out of my having done mathematics at university when I was doing, also doing economics. Um, and then at a later point, uh, it was back, back to say 1971 when I was doing undergraduate mathematics and thinking what economists call mathematics is shit. They have no idea how to do mathematical modelling properly. Um, anyway, when I came back to do my master's and then PhD, I'd heard of this guy called John Blatt. And he was a professor of applied mathematics. He established the mathematics department at the University of New South Wales. Before that, he was involved in working on the world's third, I think it was the third computer ever called Ciliac. Um, and, and this was something which was built in Sydney University. Um, and the reason he was in Sydney University was he got, he was a, his father was a, he and his father were refugees from the um, pogroms in, in Europe, uh, if you're not Austria in his, their, their case went to America and didn't like the politics. This is back in the McCarthyist days. And that's when they moved to Australia. So this guy's got an Austrian, American, Australian background. Um, and he was a notoriously difficult person to work with. A very capable of telling you, your idea is nonsense. I'm not going to do that. Uh, anyway, he was nominated for the Nobel Prize in Physics twice in the 1950s. I didn't get it, but was nominated. Another guy who was nominated for the Nobel Prize in economics in this case uh, was at Sydney, New South University as well, and this is called Murray Kemp. And Murray's actually a lovely man. I, mean, when, when we're, I used to play tennis with him. He used to beat me all the time. Um, lovely human being. Um, he died just recently. He was a, a major builder of neoclassical models of free, engine, of free trade, which mm -hmm. I'm a critic of, of course. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I mean, immense respect for him as a human being. Um, anyway, Murray decided one day that his only true peer at New South Wales University was John Blatt because they'd both been nominated for a Nobel Prize. So he invited John to attend a seminar 
And John sat through the seminar, and at the end of it, Murray, I wasn't there. This was a repeated story to me uh, by people who were there, including my own PhD supervisor. Um, but when the seminar finished, Murray just looked over the heads of the rest of the audience and asked John what he thought. And John had a, a heavy Austrian accent, and he replied, this is the greatest load of rubbish I have sat through in decades. If this is advanced economics, there's something seriously wrong with economics, and I intend <laughs> finding out what it is. And Tell it like, yeah. Down like a lead balloon, but he, he actually targeted, he wanted a lead zeppelin to fall on top of Murray. And uh, Murray was, didn't change Murray's approach to economics one zot, as it happens. But anyway, um, so he black true to his word, he needs to show the thoroughness of the man. He didn't just go and read an economics textbook, he went back and read every major work from uh, Cantillon forward. And his final decision was the greatest economist of all time was Francois Quenet, okay, the last of the physiocrats, the one who developed the table of economic. And um, so he went right through the classical school and the neoclassical and all the equilibrium analysis they do and how flawed it is. Uh, it was a truly brilliant book. So that's one that I return to whenever I can. And um, one thing I'm pleased to say, it's now available again. It was actually out of print for a long, long time and it's now been re reproduced very, very well okay. uh, in an electronic version. So I've now uh, got a copy of that. So that's one I return to when I can. Uh, I go back to Schumpeter when I have a chance. I read some of Keynes's papers. I don't particularly like the general theory. Um, I go back and read Marx, but it's ages since I've had a chance to read Marx. I read everything Marx ever wrote in economics uh, between 80, uh, 1844 and I think uh, you can pretty much date it 1867. Um, because he wrote the last, the last volumes of Capital where he's unedited, his unedited notes for the first volume of Capital as it happens. Um, so, yeah, I return to books when I can, but the trouble is these days I'm so damn busy, uh, I just don't get a chance to go back and, and read uh, for pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. What was, that, the, what was that first book that you mentioned, the, the guy who yelled over the people's heads? It's called Dynamic Economic Systems, A Post-Keynesian Approach by John Blatt, B-L-A-T-T. And uh, you can, if you just search for his name and then the book, you'll find a link to buy it for, in the electronic version. Highly worthwhile. Hmm. Good. Okay, well, that was a really nice story. And that's, uh, I, I find that Steve does a lot of nice, um, generous drops of references uh, in our shows, right? If you think back, mm -hmm. Steve, you, you do mention things. It's our job to put them on and and make it easier for people to find mm. um what i want to i want to throw an idea your way because um i i would love to try and amp the the show up a little bit and mm -hmm. we've kind of been talking about it but i you know i don't i don't i don't want to inundate you with a proposal i think it's actually better that the three of us kind of talk about it um mm. so i don't do you think it would be too much to try and get uh stephanie kelton in a a, a live show I know Stephanie. Well, she's working her butt off as usual, yeah. but she's a good friend, so I can drop her a note and say, "Would you have time for a podcast?" So, yeah. Well, my my proposal would be something similar to the way we have, except for I'd like to see a live show, and I'd like to have a, a little bit of a different theme because we want it to, uh, you know, be advantageous for her as well. Mm, yeah. Um, and I think. Uh, you know, it might even be worthwhile for us to kind of up the ante and do something uh, a little bit higher production, a little bit mm -hmm. more focused, uh, you know, something that, uh, you know, kind of cuts through the noise. And, um, uh, the, you know, just to get the ball rolling on an idea is that yeah. I'm I'm coming into the um, into the post uh, Keynesian world and also mm -hmm. MMT as somebody with um, very new to these concepts mm -hmm. and uh, as a, as somebody that's new coming into the concept of MMT, I kind of look at it this way and I go, it, you know, correct me if I'm wrong here. Right. But mm. we're sitting on a huge untapped resource of finance with an asterisk beside it. Okay. So it does feel like it comes with a lot of responsibility, especially if we um, leverage MMT to some of its full potential. Mm. But 
it seems to me that we have a potential to do some pretty unique and creative things with the creation of money. Mm. And what I would like the show to be is some examples of that, right? Like, Say, for example, we refunded, defunded, reorganized anything from, you know, defense budgets to, um, you know, manufacturing sector or, uh, you know, the arts, humanities, for example. Mm. Uh, incentivizing people to do non-GDP produced, uh, you know, final goods uh, does what? Does this elevate inflation, which is the anathema, according to MMT? Right. So it's like, wait a minute, there's an abundance. There's an ability to provide an abundance of revenue, of money, of buying potential and capital, um, you know, into the markets for what purpose? Right. Mm. And does, you know, one particular example, what would we have to guard against in terms of inflation? You know, these types of things that that was the idea. And I, I don't know if that's. Um, but we'd have to kind of think about each episode and and give a, a you know a particular scenario. But I think my, my, the reason why I was pushing for that is that the policymakers can actually think, oh yeah, that's okay. Here's an example of how we can, because I'm telling you, our politicians are kind of like dead weight. You know, they just don't even oh, get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, worse than dead weight. Yeah. Um, and you know, I'm watching Australia's prime minister at the moment make a fool of himself by. So you're saying you're saving money by not building, by not funding hospitals to fight COVID. Well, that's really good. Yeah. Um, it, it, in, insane ideas of what is what is the role of government, in that case, to stop spending when its real role is to spend sensibly. So, but yeah, yeah. it's a bit it's a bit difficult to do that. I mean, what what you'd want to do is say, well, you know, what are some of the methods by which you could have government funding in a way that didn't annoy. Um, you know, people who believe the government shouldn't try to pick winners, and that's really the. Um, uh, I mean, you, you need you need things which mean the government isn't trying to do what the market does. Um, I agree with that in a big yeah. way, yeah. a big way. I really do. But you, I, but you yeah, yeah. Like, so, so for example, um, you know, like oh, there are some there are some things the government should manufacture. I mean, or at least pay for the building of and and pay with you know, fixed price rather than. Endless pockets, which is what they've done with the with the space race, for example, which is why the um, ULA scheme and, and so, so much what NASA's been doing is going nowhere. Uh, that's a real sign of badly badly funded government activity. Um, but you you want to find things where you say, well, you don't want a bureaucrat you know, deciding what car to build and what car to buy and et cetera, et cetera. But you do want them giving money for students and say, okay, here's money to survive as a student, um, top class education. It's difficult to get in. Uh, the, the barrier is not money. It's it's intelligence and uh, and low capacity to learn. Um, but we we're going to fund you so you can do it, and you spend the money, and that goes into the community. And uh, in, in that case, you're not trying to you know the government's not directing who spends on what. It's saying we need education. We're going to fund it well. Um, and and then so that's that sort of thing is something I think the government should be providing, and you can make a strong case for that. Um, when it comes to other things like you know today these days, like not fifty years ago, but these days, should the government be attempting to build uh, rockets for space exploration? Apparently not. Okay, and and then you've got to say, well, there's been there's been technological developments where if the government hadn't put all that money in back in the sixties, we wouldn't have the skill bases that enabled modern entrepreneurs do what they're doing, but modern entrepreneurs have gone so far past the limitations of the government system that it's better to say the government simply should be, should be funding them, uh, but not, not, uh, not trying to build it themselves. And, um, and the way they fund it, I mean, the, you know, the, you look at the open-ended funding Boeing is get, getting and the fast that's led to. Um, so they're, 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 it's a complicated story. It's not a straightforward one about how the government should spend the money. But the, the, the fundamental point, and this is the one you have to start from, is the government should be creating money for the rest of us to use, which is fundamentally for the recipients of that money, it's debt free. Um, so you have a form of money which is not based on personal debt. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the point I want to want to get across. Well, yeah. you've talked you've talked about this jubilee before, right? And mm. that's uh, and that's and that's something um, 
how, how would you envision the Jubilee actually rolling out, like the re- removal of debts for people that don't that don't know that? Well, I've actually done a lot. I've done a set of a large set of Minsky models on that, and I've got to revise them to some extent because I had the government. Uh, I have people who received the money and didn't have debt buying corporate shares. But it's been pointed out to me recently that uh, corporations are, at the moment are obsessed with, you know, um, leverage, not just leverage buyouts, but also share buybacks. So it may be very hard to get the corporate sector to issue those shares. So maybe you should use it for another form of asset market. But I have done a model of how Jubilee would work. And it's it's fundamentally that the government um, can simply issue issue money to people and back that money by bonds. Okay, so exactly this at the moment the government spends when the government gives a welfare check, it doesn't give a, a, a debt to the welfare recipient for that. Okay, mm-hmm. it, it it runs a, it, it runs its own personal deficit. The government runs its, its its deficit, and that creates a surplus for the welfare recipient. That sort of thing. And I've done the mechanics to how that could be done. So it is quite straightforward. It's just like an expanded version of typical government funding right now. Um, but then what you'd be using it to do is say, well, as a recipient of this money, if you have debt, you must pay your debt down. If you don't have debt, then well, the, the, and there's the, like you, know, you, you don't want to, if an old-fashioned debt you believe would just benefit those who'd borrowed money. Okay, So people who said, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to involve my household speculation, I'm going to rent, would lose out. So the idea of the modern debt jubilee is everybody gets the same amount of money. Mm. Those who are in debt must pay their debt down. Those who don't get a cash injection, which is a it doesn't discriminate whether you were were or were not somebody who borrowed money to gamble on rising house prices. That's the way to do it that way. Once you've done it that way, what it, if you think about dividing society into three classes, those who own their houses outright, okay, those who are, have a mortgage, and those who rent. Now, you, if you, you get an income, you mentioned the ones who own the houses outright are more likely to be wealthy, okay? Uh, the ones in the mortgages wealthier than those who rent, the ones who rent more numerous than the other two. So what do you be, when you do the cash injection, because there are more people who are renting than who own their houses outright, it's actually an, it's a wealth redistribution as well. Not, not in absolute terms, okay? Yeah. Everybody gets an increase in their nominal wealth. But more of that goes to people who are poor than are rich. So it reverses what's happened with quantitative easing. Where more's gone to people who are rich than are poor, because QE was designed to boost the house, the price of shares. It succeeded in doing that, which has made people who own shares much wealthier. Well, that's great for the people who own shares, and they're the they're the one percent. So we've actually had government policies that uh, have actually increased the inequality of the capitalist system. So I want to reverse that. And and quite and and, and um, uh, modern debt jubilee would do that. It's all right. Yeah, let, let me just add that. Yeah, uh, you know, it was just today that I had a conversation about how this whole fantasy that the ruling class doesn't like big government began with Reagan in the U.S. with mm. his joke that when someone knocks at the door and says. I'm from the what, government. I'm here to help. Yeah. 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 That's a, that, that's that's the last thing that you want to hear, right? Right, Nancy? Yeah. Is that the worst? So, but actually, they, they've created a tax, a ruling class pipeline inside the government. We're just being funneled into whatever they want to do. Mm. So yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's it's not the case that they want a small government. In fact, it, the larger the government for them, the better, as long as it's moving money in the right in the right direction. Yeah, and the the, the problem, the the weakness people will tackle onto with with uh, modern monetary theory in terms of ideological weakness is that the, that the desire you don't want the government getting in your way. But what's what's going on there is people are thinking about the government as, as taxing and regulating, not thinking about the government as also spending and having an attitude to spending that says spending must be creating a debt for me for the future, not for the government. Well, you take a look at it, and that simply isn't true. First of all, a government that spends more than it taxes is putting more money in than it's taking out. Okay. Uh, and secondly, uh, the the government um, when it when it is spending, I mean. That is actually increasing the, the revenue flow and the profits of the private sector. So there's, there's, a, there's, the, the, the conf- there's an enormous amount of confusion there. And the thing which people, you know, I've got the same uh, resistance. I don't want a bureaucrat telling me what to do. Okay? Now, I do want bureaucrats putting up rules that mean you have a, a well-structured society. But, you know, like, for example, when I was in education, um, 
the extent to which we had to jump through hoops set up by education bureaucrats was incredibly frustrating because it was as somebody on the ground actually doing the teaching. I knew what a joke this stuff was, but mm-hmm. I had to had to go along with the joke. So you don't that, that's the sort of intrusion that people don't want to see. But I'd rather say, well, they fund education very well, uh, give the academics the power to run the universities, give the students the spending power, and then therefore you've got the decisions about how to run the universities being done by those who actually do the work in the universities, not the bloody vice chancellors and the and the bureaucrats below them, but the academics. Uh, and you let the students do the spending. That's a good free market idea. <laughs> <laughs> and and lo and behold, you know what Steve went out and did? He got himself involved with politics, so he's going to be uh, a, a a bureaucrat, right? That's that's the that's the uh, ultimate. No, no, the politician, maybe, maybe. unfortunately, <laughs> politician, not a bureaucrat. <laughs> but um, the, but the, the thing that you just said about the government that the, these these programs actually help the private sector is that the whole Keynesian idea is that you give the the uh, workers enough money so that they can buy the stuff they're making so they can complete the 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 circuit all the way to consumption to some extent yeah i mean uh, you know it, the, the thing about what people get confused about, about with money and profits and money is a stock and profits are a flow so money is dollars and and profits are dollars per year and uh, and that leads to a lot of confusion as well but when you look at uh, in terms of profits, you see that a government deficit actually boosts profits. And if a government deficit causes a high level of employment, then it can boost wages as well. So you don't get a you don't get a negative relationship between what the government does and the private sector. You get a you get a positive reinforcing effect between the two. And the important issue is is not to let that over overwhelm the productive capabilities of the economy. And, and that's the thing where, where MMT talks about the worry about inflation. Another issue as well is innovation. You want this to actually be generating innovation rather than um, uh, preventing it. And if you look at what happened with the Soviet Union, uh, a lot of the ways about how those, the Soviet Union was were organised industrially uh, meant that the, the central planning approach suppressed innovation. And part of that was because there was such a level of demand um, relative to uh, this monetary demand was far higher than capacity to supply goods. Okay. You don't want that outcome coming out of MMT. So you've got to say, how do you set things up that you still get the excess physical capacity that is a characteristic of capitalism uh, with a high level of aggregate demand? Mm-hmm. So there, there are definitely some, you know, complicated curly parts to what it in, involves to take MMT seriously that uh, we, we haven't yet got into the literature. And that's something we, we covered undergrad, This the discrepancy between the Soviet lack of innovation and then the, the American super innovation. And the idea was that that's just what happens whenever you have a command economy. They step in there and then suddenly there's no incentive. So the government pretends to pay you, the workers pretend to work, no mm-hmm. one's really doing anything. And so what in, what's the truth behind that and, and what in, what in particular created the massive discrepancy between Soviet and American uh, industrial yeah. innovation? Well, that, that's a very, it's a very genuine point. That's the one I'm not going to um, dismiss. Uh, and I actually, I went to Cuba a few years ago and I saw the phenomenon in operation as well. And if you, you look at what is actually involved in that, the best work is done by a guy called Janos Kornai, the K-O-R-N-A-I. And Kornai is a Hungarian, econ- is a Hungarian economist who was mystified by the same thing. Why is the rate of innovation so slow in Eastern Europe and so fast comparatively in America and Western Europe? And he developed the idea of a stylized socialist economy versus a stylized capitalist one. So leave Stalin out of the picture. Uh, you can obviously blame Stalin for a lot of a lot of things, but saying there's something ab- ab- about the nature of a command economy that led to this outcome of low innovation. He said, well, if, if you have a genuine socialist economy, it's one dedicated to the maximum possible income of the maximum number of people. It's not supposed to be about the elite. It's getting every, everybody uh, what they need. And you also, you, you have a, you've got, because you started with an underdeveloped economy, then you have a desire to expand production everywhere. And therefore, when you do your five-year plan, you don't have sufficient physical resources to fulfil the needs for investment goods for all the various sectors of the economy. So everybody gets slightly less than they asked for. 
uh, which means, therefore, that you have a shortage of supply. And, uh, and, and also, because things don't never work perfectly, what actually will arrive will be less again than what you need. So there'll be ways in which the physical, um, you, you, you've, you'll be given less inputs than you need to produce the outputs you're required to produce by the plan. So the, res the sensible response to that as a manager is not to innovate. Why waste money trying to change the motorbike when you know you, can, you can't produce enough of the motorbikes given uh, the current supplies you have anyway? So what you get is, uh, forget innovation, that goes out the window. You just produce uh, as many goods as you can, which will be less than you're required to by the plan. And so what you get is um, no technological change, okay? no change in the product base itself, uh, but everybody's fully employed. But you, you, you're in queue, you have to queue to buy goods rather than having uh, the prices going up, rather than getting that sort of inflation. You get queuing. Can I tell a, can I tell a, 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 a bad Jewish joke here? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, this is... Uh, there's a, a, a you know, take uh, being a village in centrally planned Russian days, and the local commerce system says, "There is meat. There is meat in the butcher shop today. Uh, please line up for the butcher shop." The really village lines up to the butcher shop. Commerce comes out an hour or so later. There's not enough meat for everybody. The Jews will have to leave, so the Jewish people walk off. And then he comes out. There's not enough food for everybody. Uh, the the uh, men under sixty five will have to leave, except for the war veterans. And so they leave. Um, but not enough for everybody. Uh, the, the women and children will have to leave. And finally, get down to the end, there's only a couple of old, you know, over 65 war veterans standing in the line. And if I says, there is no meat, you'll all have to go home. And one veteran turns to the other and says, the Jews always get the best deal. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, I mean, the, 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 you know, incredible shortages and queuing was, was the outcome. and. And um, and now, so but you're, of, you're talking about shortages of inputs to production, right? So, and therefore, sort of, shortages of outputs as well. And yeah. therefore, people get paid more money than they can actually use. So, when you buy a television set, I'd actually know, like, I literally personally know an example one of my ex girlfriends. Okay. Um, she, she paid for a television set, and the delivery date was going to be 10 years after. So, she managed to wrangle being on a delegation to America and bought a color TV set for herself and brought it back home. Nine years before she would have got the black and white oh provided God. by the, okay, so you really got that to be that bad, and and you and that's where the classic joke comes up. They pretend to pay us and we pretend to work, which of course makes it work even less effectively. And yeah. He said the reason capitalism succeeds in taking a stylized capitalist economy the other extreme. Uh, you're trying to get a maximum profit for the minimum group. It's all about the elite. Screw the workers. Um, you know you uh, and and you got lots of. And this is the other thing, lots of firms competing for the available demand. Uh, now, when you're competing for a, a limited base of demand, it's not price competition that rules capitalism, it's quality competition, mm -hmm. product diversification. So you try to come out with a product that's different to what your competitors have and better in, in, you know, in ways that the market will appreciate. So you've got to innovate to be able to get hold of the small amount of demand that actually exists. Um, but in, in, in doing that, you also have to have excess capacity. If you don't have excess capacity and you actually do have a successful product, you can't sell it. I see. I see. So, so you're linking the qualitative result coming from having a research and development department with the, with the, the quantitative fact of having enough inputs to produce. Not just that. It's, it's also about uh, you're not trying to give everybody a car. You're trying to sell cars to the ones who can afford it. Um, so it's 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 not like a relief if you get everybody a vehicle and therefore you've got a demand like in Russia for 350 million cars, uh, which you can you can't fulfil it. So then you start getting rationing and then yeah, the queuing effect. The and, queuing effect. And you produce yeah. traverts made of cardboard, you know, uh, to make up make up for the insufficiency of of metal uh, inputs into production, all that sort of stuff. Now you're trying to produce a high quality car for a small market. And therefore, and you and you fight by innovation, and you have lots of excess capacity. So that that means you get the, the West doesn't uh, doesn't grow as uh, doesn't produce the same volume, but it it and it has booms and slumps, but it innovates. And Cornet's point was: well, you, you actually want to get the best of both worlds. You'd want to have the provision for the majority while enabling innovation to occur at the same time, and. Um, 
and that involves partially, you know, firms competing with each other, which is what the Hungarians uh, to some extent and the Yugoslavians had uh, un under their versions of, of Soviet, Soviet socialism. But when you have the single provider and uh, everybody has to queue and your wages are insufficient, blah, 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 uh, you get that classic effect, you know, we pretend to work, they, they pretend to pay us, we pretend to work. And when I went to Cuba, one thing I, I, I had a day where my meetings were cancelled and so I thought I might go to the beach and, and check out the beach and I went to the tourist section of the local the hotel I was in and there were three women at three different desks there and I just stood there waiting until one of them would make eye contact with me and they managed to avoid making eye contact for over half an hour. Just working in the paperwork. You should have filmed that experiment since it cost you so much emotional energy to stand there. So, so I then walked <laughs> up to one of them and said, I'd like to go and check out the beach. said, so go and ask one of the taxi drivers outside to drive you down there. Uh, in other words, of being such shit wages, just filling time. Well, they, uh, fulfilled, they, they fulfilled the, the new function, which is the anti-help desk. Yeah, anti-help desk. So, so th that, that is a true problem with the socialist system and with the excess aggregate demand. Um, now, you could, you could potentially reuse MMT, the knowledge of MMT, to produce substantial de demand in the economy such that you guaranteed full employment, okay? And uh, now would that then lead to cost pressures because you have waging, rising wages? Uh, would it lead to shortages? Not necessarily shortages because, uh, because you have competitive firms trying to get the, the, the maximum market share they can. There's still the desire for the individual firms to innovate, to take out their rivals. Um, uh, but you do have that potential danger that, you know, if you, if you have um, full employment, then you potentially have a, a bargaining ploy for the workers to demand wage rises. And you, 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 when you see inflation as the effect of a, a struggle over the distribution of income, then you could cause that outcome. And, and so therefore you have to say, well, the, it can't just be a policy about uh, producing, generating government money. It's got to also be something about how you negotiate with the, with the labour movement to minimise the competitive pressures class competitive pressures over the distribution of income to make sure you don't get an inflationary spiral taking place. Mm. So you but, said something very interesting about inflation that it was it was like the it was a, like the stagnation of um, of money flow. Um, I, I think if I understood that correctly, like the, the no, flow of well the, <laughs> the the flow of money being um, uh, I, I guess interrupted. Did you say something like that about when? No, no. no the, 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 I mean, the, the, the point about inflation is that it's really a, when you when you look at what could, what determines the costs of capitalists. Okay, it's it, as a class, a social class. It's fundamentally the matter of how they've got to pay to other people outside that class. And the two fundamental elements of that are workers, but also raw material providers. Now. If you have a high level of aggregate demand, as we had back in the 60s and early 70s, then that can mean you have low unemployment, which means workers have got bargaining power, and they can demand wage rises, and that can cause a wage price spiral. And you also have raw material producers, uh, where raw materials aren't subject to the same rules of production as a factory is. So a factory normally has excess capacity uh, and declining marginal costs over time. So you have constant or falling marginal costs as you increase output, uh, which is advantageous to the firms and means actually a higher level of output can mean a lower level of prices okay, because you have the capacity to do that. When you look at uh, raw materials, not the same story. If you want to pump out oil more quickly, you've got to pump, you've got to add, you've got to, you know, add to your, uh, if, you, if you're actually having to push the oil out of the soil these days rather than letting it bubble out in the old days, uh, then you have to add the pressure. You've got to, you've got to increase your energy input. Uh, and you have a, past a certain point, you do get capacity constraints. There's only a certain amount you can get out of a well. you have got to drill more wells if you want to get more output out. All that sort of stuff means that there's uh, more of a, um, um, a, a supply cost-driven price effect to raw materials. And we had that back in the 70s with uh, OPEC twice. So those are the sort of things that give you an inflationary surge. Uh, but you've got to be aware of, of those uh, income distribution issues uh, if you're going to try to run an economy at full employment while avoiding uh, 
a, you know, a debilitating inflationary spiral, which is really a, a struggle between uh, workers and capitalists over the distribution of income. Yeah, that's what I was trying to grab onto was the, the you know, the that that linkage between the, um, you know, the workers and the organizations. Mm. Um, okay, earlier you mentioned something about a um, uh, uh, the 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 modern uh, jubilee, right? And mm. in that scenario, everybody was given a, a kind of like a lump sum, whatever that ends up being, right? To kind of clear mm -hmm. off debt and yeah. so. To, I'm, I'm just curious. What do you think? It's an evolution. It's a um, inflationary pressure that 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 the rich class would uh, have so much more disposable income. Would they, you know, drive prices up and inflation? Is that would there be an inflationary pressure from the surplus from the of capital? The for wealthy? Yeah, from the jubilee. No, no, that op opposite. Uh, if you think about, uh, like, I've done one little model where I had workers and capitalists, workers, bankers, and capitalists, effectively. And um, because there's, you know, workers are 90 to 95 percent of the population and capitalists are 5 percent, then 95 percent of the Jubilee money goes to workers and 5 percent to capitalists. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what you get is a dramatic uh, reduction in wealth inequality, not by taking wealth off the poor, off mm -hmm. the rich, but by giving the same amount to everybody, which has far more impact upon the wealth levels of the poor than it has upon the rich. That's brilliant. Well, it really is. I years ago, somebody asked me if I won a lottery, how would I spend the money? And I, I had this egalitarian sort of thing in my head. I so I just split it equally because you know for the rest of my life, I would hear from you know people in the in the family that said I never gave enough to that one or someone did. I said, well, screw it, screw it. I just take it and divide it, uh, you know, a hundred ways and say there's no more money, <laughs> mm, mm, mm. right? Like. You know these big lotteries where you've got a hundred million dollars or something. You know, I'd be fine with a hundred thousand dollar. You know, what what does that do for all of your whole family? You know, to yeah, yeah, partially pay off a home. You know, and you know, it could really, really provide a, a, a nice distributed sort of thing. And I and I and I and I always thought, even people around me would say, "Wow, that's <laughs> that that's that's noble. You could actually share that a hundred ways." And I was like, "Why is that so difficult?" Like, what is it about our nature that makes that so difficult? Because someone will say, well, I would do this, I do that, I blah, blah, blah. Mm. And, you know, it's it's just a weird phenomenon of how we we kind of hoard money. Yeah, I mean, well, it's it, it, we've made it the reward system for our, for our society. So, and, and like the rewards of having that wealth are and, you know, enormous. I mean, uh, when you see some of the ludicrous, uh, if, you know, uh, Toys that the rich have bought themselves with the with the wealth they've got these days, you know, sippy yachts, uh, you know, mansions for their pets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, there's, there's there's simply absurd stuff that comes out of this concentration of wealth. Uh, but it you know when you have that level of wealth, um, it's it's very um, seductive because it means as, as I remember, I think it was in uh, uh, with the guy who um, a book called The Ebony Tower. John, I can't think of John John's last name, but the book called The Ebony Tower, and he has uh, a character who's a butterfly collector who actually wins a lottery and is, is obsessed with a particular woman, so he tries to capture her using the revenue he's got from the lottery. And at one point, having gone from having no money to lots of money, this character says, with money there are no barriers. And, and that's the seductive thing for that level of wealth. Whatever you want to do, you can do. Now, uh, we've always had hierarchies in our societies, but what capitalism gives us is a sort of distributed hierarchy, not just one person at the top, then it could be dozens who've accumulated that much wealth. But once they've got that level of wealth, they've, you know, they've, the, the freedom that gives them is something that they're not about to give up voluntarily. And, uh, and, and that is partly the, the reason you see you know, tax evasion, uh, all, all the, the struggles to dominate the system. Uh, they, they don't want their, they've got real freedom. And they don't want it taken away. Yeah. Speaking of motivation, so what do you say to people when you're discussing a universal basic income and they say, well, actually, it'd be better. And I think Keynes maybe said something like this. You can't just give people money directly. You have to bury it in the ground and then pay them to dig it out with shovels. And at least that way you get them out of their houses because you don't want to 
train them and condition them to be rewarded for sitting at home, watching TV, playing with themselves, having babies, doing nothing. So you need to get something to force them, even if it's just pretend nothing, busy work. It, it, you, it has to be, this must, there must be some suffering in, in there. To, otherwise it's wrong and it, and it creates bad humans. Yeah, um, the funny thing is neoclassical economics, effectively you see are all starting from that situation anyway. Okay. But what they argue is that work is a, dis a disutility and leisure is a utility. And if you're not paid enough, you'll forget about doing your work and just enjoy leisure. Now, the only way you can enjoy leisure in the real sense is if you have an income that's independent of you having to work. Okay. So in a, in a ridiculous way, the neoclassicals start assuming we could all decide not to work because we've got another source of self-sufficiency that means we've got to be enticed by a wage to come out and work um, it's something we wouldn't otherwise do. So their, their starting point is to assume that's where we are. Now, the reality is we're not. If you don't get a job in a capitalist system without, without welfare, you, you starve to death. So you, you, there's no such thing as leisure when you're starving. Uh, so yeah. that, that is the weakness in how the neoclassicals think about it. But like in terms of uh, a universal, when you think, think about a, a properly developed human society, not the, the monstrosities we have today, but go back to our you know, Cro-Magnon roots, uh, we lived in communities and a large part of your status in that community is what your contribution was to it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't... Uh, you know, uh, you won't, when we look at those societies, they tended to be gift societies. People would do what they could, which was special, and gift what they made to other people, expecting, of course, gifts back. So it's a, a, a gift-based society is what we came from. And that's what I'd like. To, if, we, if you wanted to reproduce the best of human culture and you want to get back to the stages where you, you do what you do to make a contribution to a community you're part of. Yeah. Now, um, that's feasible uh, with a universal basic income. If people then said, okay, I feel like I'm receiving this on behalf of my own community and I'm going to do stuff for my community, whether that's, you know, painting or, um, you know, do, doing nature reclamation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it, it's, it, we, we've forgotten just how far we've removed ourselves from the foundations of human society to live in the types of societies we do these days, where you don't even know who your neighbours are half the time or 90% of the time. Um, so if we had societies designed on the, the basis of the types of societies we used to live in, you'd have about 150 neighbours. You all you knew all, you'd know all of them. Um, you'd be you'd inter, you know, interacting with them and their regard for you was be a major, major determinant of your own behaviour. Now, when we tr and that would be the ultimate world for a UBI. I mean, I'll, I'll give you one another thing, though, which I think was quite remarkable. Yeah, sorry. I have something to add on to that that yeah. I think is kind of opposite to you, or something to maybe think about. Yeah, it's a technocrat. It's a it's it's like the you know the rise of the technocrat, right? So it's this um, or it's an advocate for the technocratic society or uh, mm. technology based society. Okay, mm. so. If I if I make the claim that even the three people in this virtual room together, although mm -hmm. we're not in a physical proximity, we may have like beamed into our little pods in mm -hmm. Taiwan and in Vancouver and and Houston, but the 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 alignment and the synergy that happens between our three minds was only brought to us because of the technology. Oh, in yeah, our isolate, so, so yeah. think of it as like a, um, like the neural network just w raised up one other level of of uh, oh, no, yeah, completely evolution sort of yeah. thing, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, like I, if you into like just it, 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 to parody what I was talking about a while ago, one of, one of the reasons I couldn't stand the university bureaucrats was they tried to make the department become a specialist in a particular area, uh, whereas like when I'm working with my economics, the main people I work with were. A, an electric, electronic engineer in ha halfway up the coast of Norway, um, a mathematician in in Toronto, um, you know, a, a, a Jesuit priest in France. Um, so there's, uh, you know, the, 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 that sort of regional, local base 
has been transformed by what we've got with the internet these days, and I wouldn't want to lose that. Absolutely. Yeah. But yeah. I'm saying I can, in, for, for the vast majority of people, if you're working in a nine to five job, um, or these days it's eight to six, eight to seven job, um, and you come back to a community where you don't know anybody, et cetera, et cetera, it's, it's, it, in that sort of world, if you gave the universal basic income, there's, you, yes, you could get to lie around in your ass doing, doing nothing, which could be a negative. But like at some extent, uh, we want if, with with global warming, uh, we'll want people lying in their asses doing nothing because exactly you know. So there's, there's all the, we, we, the, the the mess we've created for ourselves is so enormous. But yeah. if I if I wanted to imagine a, a future society where we've gone through survive what we're going to do with, it with climate change and come up with the society on the other side, then as, 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 this sounds space cadet, but I'm going to stick with it anyway. In that world, we would be doing most of our production offshore, off planet. Oh, off planet, yeah. Okay. And then, and then the whole idea of working would be something we'd have to redefine uh, because to work, you need to be in outer space. Um, the vast majority of the productive capability of, of our civilization. So at, at some point, we've got to confront that hassle between giving income on the basis of work and giving income on the basis of being. A human being, and um, you know, I, I, I'm not particularly fond of the debate at either extreme that I see at the moment because a lot of the advantage of advocates for a, a job guarantee are trashing the idea of universal basic income. And, and I like your point. The reason the reason yeah. I ask the question that way is because most people, when I argue this with them, they use the human nature argument. But they leave the fact out that the human nature has been artificially engineered. We've become yeah, antisocial. Yeah. So, of course, antisocial people are going to act like selfish jerks. But, I mean, imagine if you have been raised in a healthy society where, like you said, self-esteem and happiness mm. is correlated with good relationships with other people, mm. which actually is, it probably is. I mean, if you believe in anything of evolutionary psychology, we're intrinsically oriented to be pro-group. And, and we, we, we're concerned about the facial expressions of other primates making us feel mm. bad. So all this stuff is is it would be out and and about and it's not the case that we would all sit around and eat as many Doritos as possible and close our doors as tightly as possible. It's just it's just not it's not what we are. But they use this argument. They say human nature is to be a maximally selfish, isolationist, antisocial person. Which is so you'd totally have a bunch wrong. of you'd have a bunch of monads, and no monad would work. Every monad would sit around by itself. But but like my professor used to say. People, when they're bored, spontaneously, I guess you can call it play, but there's there's going to be some activity aimed towards matter, reconfiguring matter for the yeah. sake of use value or fun or sharing or gift giving. Like you said, look what I can do for you. It's just, it's just like it's an instinct. Yeah, and like I'll give a, a lovely anecdote that came out of an Australian TV show um, decades ago now involving some Solomon Islanders, you know, which is a you know, an underdeveloped third world country, blah, blah, blah brought out to Australia for training and they're filming their experiences in Australia. But what the Solomon Islanders, uh, we all came from the same, I think they came from this, they don't think they came from the same village, pardon me, but they all lived in village lives back in the Solomon Islands. And they found themselves walking past people sleeping on the streets in Sydney. And they said, why, why are they doing that? And the uh, interviewer said, oh, they're homeless. And so what's homeless? And they then had it explained to them, what a homeless person was, and they were simply incredulous. Why haven't you made another home for them then? They were just in shock yeah. at the whole concept of somebody being homeless because if you're in a village in the Solomon Islands and your hut gets wiped out by a tornado or a, a you know, tsunami or whatever else, you, the community gets together and builds the housing, housing again. So these Solomon Islanders who are supposed to be out to Australia to learn something about Western technology take back to the Solomon Islanders, actually end up organising a charity to raise money for the homeless in Sydney. Wow. You know? So that, that is more, if you want to say human nature, okay, let's go back to when we hadn't distorted uh, what that nature was by the complex societies we've generated. And it's, it was a cooperative society where you were rewarded for your contribution to the community, which was expected to be done in an altruistic way. With everybody being altruistic, then... There was no need for compulsion for work. Hierarchies develop, you know, social structures, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it was not at any stretch the sort of lie on a couch do fuck all world we have these days because people feel so alienated. Yeah. 
you know. And in, in, in my little science fiction imagination, I would imagine a young entrepreneur walking by or and seeing this and thinking, wow, look, they're naturally suckers. They're suckers by nature. How can we exploit the Solomon Islanders? They're willing to do free labor. Come on, let's think of something. <laughs> Wait yeah. a minute. As an entrepreneur, that's not what we think of, or at least that's not what I think of. Mm. Well, this is a really interesting thing. There's like assumptions and you say, well, okay, well, what, what's the entrepreneur thinking of? And Steve, you come from a bit a bit different a pedigree from an entrepreneur, but I, I think you'll understand the sentiment here. Um, you know, there's things that an entrepreneur can do. And I think it's kind of like an extension of what Scott was saying, when people have more freedom to do things, right? Mm. Um, essentially, an entrepreneur has the freedom. They're taking the freedom. Yeah, um, and now the they're they're assessing it with risk. They're saying, holy shit, if I don't do this, I'm not going to eat. Right. Mm. But essentially, they're trying to play and provide value and do something in the society that's worth something. I'm not yeah, saying there's not bad actors in the system, mm. but I am saying that it's kind of like um, for the well, for the most part, I don't know. I think there's some pretty good innovations and the the market overall provides a good um, more good than 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 evil, right? Yeah, I mean, innovation certainly is the strength, the outstanding strength of capitalism. And well, yeah. the point we don't want to lose in, in any society that it's evolves from capitalism, given the weaknesses of capitalism, you, 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 the best way to become wealthy in capitalism is to socialise your losses and privatise your profits. Um, mm -hmm. So we've, we've got that side we have to restrain. But the innovation side, uh, it is, is, is the stark contrast with the feudal period and with the socialist states. Innovation by far is the thing that capitalism has as its positive. And uh, the thing is, would, would a UBI improve that? And the answer is quite possibly yes, because if you knew you could try something new uh, and if you failed, then you'd still have an income. There's a big difference to try something new and if you fail, you're starved to death. So... Um, in that sense, a UBI could be part of enabling people to continue innovating um, yeah. without without the risk of, of wiping out their capacity to stay alive. And there, the, to the east-west distinction that you brought up earlier in production also applies to the to these little individuals. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, again, having a surplus that allows you to experiment is is yeah. a, or having a surplus is a necessary condition for, for being able to take risks and do that type of stuff. Yeah, yeah. They've got to be, uh, I mean, you, you see the extreme of people like, you know, Elon Musk so saying that when he was building what became PayPal, uh, they had one computer. Uh, it had run during the day and he'd code at night. Uh, they, they, they didn't, they slept in the office and had their showers at the YMCA, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that 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 is the length you've got to go to to be innovative without money in a capitalist society. Yeah. Uh, if you had the okay, case, there's a UBI coming in, you can afford to rent, you can afford to, you can go and get a job if you like, or you can attempt to build your own company. Um, then maybe we'd see more innovation, not less. Yeah, and I do have to point out that if we had to roughly go down by uh, you know ninety percent of our economy and our output, then we really want to have some sort of incentive and it sounds weird but we have to have an incentive to tell people to stay home to cool yeah. their you know spending habits and you know really think about um you know trying to make the products and uh, that they have last longer um you know stay at home and uh, um you know not frivolously travel all over the place right i mean there's a whole mentality to it right there's a whole it's a whole game that people have to figure out. I think the market has to actually figure that out. And I envision the, the uh, you know, the biggest position to be uh, hired for or filled by our governments would be to exactly be that somebody who is a, uh, a carbon conscious citizen. Here's your salary, mm. you know, and it's your game to try and be as carbon conscious as you can. Right. I mean, yeah. You know, do you got to walk two extra miles to not take the bus even? I mean, people do all sorts of interesting things, right? You know, put it on social media. I don't know. Like, I love a society that was like that. You know, what's yeah, on news yeah. on this week, right? Like, uh, you know, Sally's got, you know, down on a, on a four week streak of zero carbon or something, right? Like, uh, I'm, not, yeah, I'm not saying the systemic things have to not change, but, you know, it's... Uh, that's a good idea. You could have Kim Kardashian walking to the grocery store 
and then winking at the camera and suddenly it would be a, a it would be intrinsically valuable to the walk to the grocery store and you wouldn't even have to have to mention carbon and and with, I, I have a little silicon remark so I, I live next to whole foods headquarters and every week the marketing geniuses are coming up with some new misty eyed picture of some woman in africa standing next to a, a well that was paid for with micro lending that, which was helped by whole foods it's just, I'm, I'm really cynical about this whole thing because, because it, it ends up being advertising. I wonder how much good it does. You know, all these like these green, like McDonald's, they have a picture of a, they used to put like they had MLK's face on, mm. on bags for a few years. And they, of course they made them look like a white person. And then they, they had, you know, lots, lots of trees and there were green bags there. So all these, these companies are trying to make themselves look like they're super carbon conscious and, and pro green just by having 1% of their, Profit going to you know, they're building wells in Africa, and it just and, and but but because they do that, the walls are full of these pictures of little dark skinned children and women with pregnant women mm. next to wells and stuff. And it looks like wow, you know, we're in the headquarters of like the the most altruistic uh, organism on the planet. They call it greenwashing for a good reason. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. With, with what I'll have to see. I think is is huge constraints on the level of production we allow and enable. And and during if we as we start going through the impact of climate change and realizing how destructive it is and having to cut back our, our load on the planet, then yeah, we're going to be imposing dramatic controls on what you can produce and how many varieties of goods there are and so on. So I, I see us falling into a command economy uh, because we've overdone the capitalist one. Yeah. Hmm. Well, on that note. Um, <laughs> That's right at the top of the hour. Steve, you're always punctual on time and we uh, appreciate your time. So I think um, unless anybody else has something else to say, we'll see Steve again next week. Uh, Scott, uh, Steve, do you have anything else to say? That'll do me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, guys. Go. Bye. Yep. Bye. Bye.